Good morning and welcome to Viva Farms. My name is Rob Smith and uh, we are happy to offer a video this morning on small scale animal husbandry. And uh, I'm here with Eric Olson from Wellfed Farms and he's going to be uh, explaining a little bit about uh, his, his pig and pork operation here at Viva. Thanks for being willing to talk with us today. Yeah, thanks for being interested. Yeah. Um, so Eric, um, could you tell us a little bit about why you decided to raise pigs and, and how it works with your production and business plans as part of your whole farm operation? Sure. Uh, yeah, I've been farming for about nine or 10 years in some regard now. And when I first got started, I was really focused on veggies. I thought I'd be a vegetable farmer, mixed organic crops. Um, and gradually as I got going year after year, I worked some livestock in there, first starting with chickens for eggs and then chickens for meat. For a number of reasons, pigs seemed like a logical extension of that. The first year I did pigs was probably about seven years ago. And I just started off with two. Um, a friend was raising them for a small commercial venture and I was curious. And so I said, hey, could I get a couple? And he was kind enough to oblige. and raised them out just for uh, personal use and for some Christmas gifts for friends and family and realized I, I really liked them as animals. Um, and I thought that in terms of the management that they required, um, how they used space on the farm um, and a number of other reasons that it might be a good fit. And since then I've scaled up year to year. I went from two to doing 10 to doing 15, uh, did 15 for a couple years. Um, and was selling those to customers that I already um, had cultivated for other markets. Uh, I sold a lot of chickens direct to um, home consumers, people who would buy meat cool. for, you know, the entirety of the year, put it in their freezer. And, you know, selling 15 hogs wasn't too difficult and uh, managing them was not too difficult uh, either. And so I got to a point gradually where I said, oh, I'm gonna bump it up. And so I went to 30 pigs and during this time i'd been bouncing around to a number of different uh land rental arrangements and that was and still is in a way kind of the limiting factor but uh, uh two years ago i guess it was i got hooked up with viva mm -hmm. um, you guys expressed interest in integrating livestock into your model and all of a sudden my access to land increased quite a bit and had enough capital, um, felt like I had enough potential markets that I decided to bump it up even more. Did 50 last year and this year I'm doing about 60. 60. Wow. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I would say in terms of gross sales, about a third of my business if I had to estimate at this point. However, it is also the part of my business that requires the most capital um, to, to fund. Uh, on the other end though, it requires the least amount of labor. You know, yeah. I employ seasonally about three full-time people uh, on my farm, but most of that is for my vegetable production. Mm -hmm. And the pigs, I can effectively manage those myself yeah. in my free time. I said for a big day here and there, where I might bring a helper or two out to move them. Yeah. Um, so there are pluses and minuses to it, but it's, I would say out of everything I do, it's one of the things I enjoy the most. Yeah. Maybe we can get a little bit more detail, Eric, on, um, you know, sort of the process from piglet to market. You know, what are the links in the chain and sort of the talking about the process of, uh, of raising pigs? Sure, definitely. Um, I'm gonna start with a disclaimer that my process is my own. It's something that I've developed based on services that I have access to mm -hmm. and my own personal preferences and requirements. Um, someone else who might decide to raise pigs themselves in a different locality especially may find that my process does not work at all mm -hmm. and that they'd have to develop their own. But yeah. just to give you an introduction into it, um, I do what is called a wiener to finish operation um, in the uh, industry lingo, I guess you'd say. Sure. That means I start with wiener pigs, which technically speaking, I think is like a piglet under 35, 40 pounds or something. Okay. Uh, I work with a breeder over in Eastern Washington that I have gotten my piglets from since I 
first started seven years ago. Mm -hmm. um, and every spring, usually in mid-April, I take a trip over there, uh, drive over um, with a pickup truck and a canopy when I was doing fewer, and now I take a stock trailer over mm -hmm. um, and pick up uh, my piglets. Um, we meet halfway in Wenatchee, so it's not uh, a huge drive, but I still have to budget a day for it. Um, and this year I made two trips over because the number of pigs that I was getting from her required that she uh, sourced them from a number of different litters. You know, I think uh -huh. a good litter of pigs is anywhere between eight to ten piglets. So getting 60 pig this year, uh -huh. I had to get uh, pigs from probably six, seven, eight wow. different litters. Um, so yeah, I go and get those in April, uh, bring them back to the west side, uh, depending on what the weather is like and the ground I'm using, uh, whether it's still wet or not, I might house them temporarily in um, a smaller pen that has shelter. Um, mm -hmm. This year we were pretty lucky in that the uh, ground at Viva that I'm renting had uh, a couple of nice loafing sheds on it, you know, which are just kind of three-sided temporary, not temporary, they're permanent structures. Like a, like a but lean-to. Yeah, like yeah. a lean-to, and I think they were built for horses or cows, but they provide a really good shelter. You just toss some straw in there and the pigs are, you know, not not too big at this point yeah. you know so they don't take up much space and they can hang out there for a month or so until the weather gets warmer and drier and then we move them out to pasture which we've uh, kind of demarcated ahead of time we go ahead and use uh, portable electric fencing i've found is the the best strategy if you want a pretty good sized pen and one that you can move mm -hmm. frequently and easily. It's the most bang for your buck. Yeah, uh, flexible. You're flexible too yeah. yeah yeah you don't have to set it up in any particular shape you can make it a triangle you can make it a square a rectangle octagon you can work you know with weird borders if you're trying to dodge around um, things in the landscape or other farmers is the case out here uh, who you want to create a buffer with sure um, and then yeah they live out the next six seven months of their life in these pens which depending on their size and how fast they go through the uh, pasture and forage in the uh, pen so yeah we basically move them every three or four weeks sometimes if it's really rainy and the pigs are really big we might move them even more frequently than that mm -hmm. if we have enough ground um, to move them on to basically trying to keep them first of all comfortable and healthy you know pigs on really wet muddy ground are more prone to developing diseases parasites um, mm -hmm. potentially slipping and straining themselves um, getting in like a the pig equivalent of like a, sp a sprained sure. ankle yeah. as they get older it also can be rougher on the ground to create more you know once it's wet they can do a lot more sure. damage yeah. and turn stuff up and so it's harder to work back out into flat uh, croppable yeah. ground later on yeah. which is what we try and do in theory you know we want to follow the pigs in subsequent years by growing crops there and take advantage of the manure that, that they put down. Fertility. Yeah. Uh huh. Exactly. We get to a point in the fall where they're getting fairly large and ready to go to slaughter. Um, and we're also, you know, getting to a point where it's more difficult to manage them for the weather. Um, mm -hmm. You know, turning south, we've had a couple good years now where it stayed fairly dry and clement into you know October and even early November. But I wouldn't be inclined to push it much longer than that unless I had access to really good, dry, abundant, secure barn space, yeah. which, you know, as a startup farm, you're probably not going to find yeah. access to. Yeah. Um, and building it is pretty prohibitive too. That's an investment and requires you to own land and all these other things. So yeah, we do our operation as a seasonal thing, yeah. just to, to clarify there. Mm -hmm. um, and then in October and November, over several different dates, uh, the butcher comes in, or in our case, we use a number of different butchers. Um, we're lucky enough in this neighborhood to have access to a couple of different mobile butchers mm -hmm. um, so they for the most part come out to where the pigs are oh, yeah. uh, slaughter them on site and then take them back to their uh, facility and butcher them there um, and at that point they're either collected by customers who have purchased a whole or a half animal ahead of time mm -hmm. or I as the grower take them uh, 
cut up and packaged at that point and frozen, stick them in a freezer and then sell them myself. Mm -hmm. um, sell to them my, as cuts. As cuts, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and for a number of reasons, that latter option, being able to take them as um, the farmer and sell them later as cuts, is not always going to be a viable option for people who are getting into a startup pig business. Sure. Um, Sounds like a mm -hmm. lot. I mean, it's a lot more work from a marketing standpoint. It's more more work. A whole or a half, and it's out the door. And yeah, that's a nice thing to be able to have your, you know, um, you know, pigs done for the season and the money in your bank account. Uh, you have to have more. Uh, money and security to be able to finance uh, freezing and selling yeah. later. Yeah. And you also um, have to have access to uh, certain services to facilitate that. You have mm -hmm. to have access, first of all, to a USDA butcher, which we'll talk a little bit more about yeah. later. Um, and there are unfortunately not very many of those left um, starting in, I think, the 70s or 80s. Uh, there used to be a ton of those. A lot of them closed up shop and for regulatory and uh, financial reasons, there are very, very few that are being started. Um, and of those, even fewer provide services to small scale farmers like mm -hmm. myself. They're usually part of large vertically integrated um, industrial hog operations. Yep. Um, and then your second constraining factor is uh, storage space, mm -hmm. basically having access to uh, freezer. Uh, there are some commercial cold storage facilities around, but they don't always want to do business with people who are operating on a small scale, nor are they cost effective to do business with if yeah. they are willing to. Um, you can go ahead and build your own, but that is another layer of cost and requires you have a space to do that as mm -hmm. well. Um, but yeah, kind of back to the question. Uh, at that point, we, we wrap up for the season. Um, all the animals are off pasture, so we try and clean up a little bit, put our equipment away, um, and then uh, take, you know, what I like to think is a well-deserved break sure. over the winter um, yeah, yeah. and start again next season. Some people choose to breed their own pigs. They yeah. will keep um, a boar and sows to breed, which, um, is about an eight month gestation period, pretty similar to a human. Um, and so if they want their piglets born in the springtime in April, they need to be thinking about breeding them in August wow. or September. And then they have to keep, you know, what are effectively very large animals, yeah. uh, happy, dry and healthy yeah. during the winter. Um, and then they have the added risk of, well, what if something goes wrong there? You know, what if the nutrition for the sows wasn't good enough? And rather than getting the 10 piglets per litter that we were banking on, we only got five, yeah. um, you know. Uh, so that's one reason I haven't chose to do that because it's just more work and requires more expertise and also because yeah. it requires space. Yeah, um, infrastructure. Yeah, I, I think it's a very noble idea and from a idealistic standpoint um, and also from just a personal curiosity standpoint, I would like to try it at some point yeah. in time, but I, I know that I don't have the space or the focus to do that yeah. right now. And so I've opted not to take that route at this mm -hmm. point in time. Cause at the end of the day, you know, I, I farm for, um, business reasons. I have a lot of personal investment and want to make the world better in some capacity. But if you try and put too much energy into that particular thing, in my experience, you will end up kind of hamstringing yourself in terms of being able to do it in a profitable fashion yeah. and you might be doing it for a couple years but you're not going to be doing it for a career or a lifetime and yeah. so that's one compromise i've chose to make yeah. at this yeah particular yeah. point where and, i'm at and like you say this the services that are available i mean there's mm -hmm. you can let those folks specialize in that mm -hmm. and and it works out from a business standpoint so it's yeah yeah you our, can't do it all yeah you, know. you can do it all yeah. uh but our economy um love it or hate it uh, reward specialization yeah. and the more you are willing to compromise and specialize the more profitable you're going to be the more you're going to be able to have a life that has some independence from this thing that you're doing to earn money yeah. um, I know of one guy down in uh, Montesano uh -huh. uh, kind of down by Aberdeen who okay. is doing 
what would be like the the entirely holistic operation. He yeah, sure. bought an old dairy down there, land for whatever reason, and this area is pretty pretty cheap. Was pretty cheap, um, and he was able to get a like an eighty acre dairy with a whole bunch of buildings that were valued at nothing on the yeah, appraisal, but, but still served the purpose for what he wanted to do. And so he keeps his own breeding stock, breeds his own pigs, and he also grows his own feed, which is a whole another layer. Yeah, you know, um, so he's going out every spring. Uh, planting peas, you know, planting wheat and barley every fall, um, harvesting it, processing it, storing it, and feeding it to his animals, um, and then doing all his own marketing as well. And it's super cool, but man, he's he's got a lot of work and, you know, he's got a lot more exposure too if something goes wrong, sure. yeah. you know, he, he, he may not be able to pay his mortgage and he works hard. I feel like I work hard, he works way harder yeah. than I do. Yeah. and. You know, I would love a world where that was a viable option. That's how things work. But until the bigger picture changes, that picture may not have a very um, easy to find space within it. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. So try and make incremental changes is kind yeah. of where I'm at at this point. Yeah. Yeah. So could you tell us a little bit more about requirements for slaughter specifically and mm -hmm. USDA requirements and, and how that works? Yeah, there are effectively three different tiers for slaughtering pigs for food. The first tier is just doing it on a home scale where you raise a pig, you can go out and slaughter and butcher it yourself for your own use. No one can really say or do anything about that and I would encourage anyone who has the interest in the space to give that a try. You know, there was a time when that was not too uncommon. Sure. You know, if you had a piece of ground, you would keep a couple pigs, especially because you might have a family milk cow as well. You have extra, you know, whey and non-fat milk to feed to it. It was kind of a holistic thing. Wendell Berry actually wrote a really good essay on that. If oh, yeah. I forget what it's called, but it'd be worth checking out yeah. if you can find it. Um, but that's kind of a, more of a bygone thing. So if you're doing it as a commercial venture now, uh, in Washington state at least, you are limited to two different types of slaughter. The first one is what's called custom exempt slaughter. And once again, this is specific to Washington state. Uh, every state has its own regulations on it, but there are others who have it. Um, effectively how that works is from a technical standpoint, a end consumer, uh, an individual or a family a household buys a half or a whole pig while it's still alive and then contracts with a butcher hmm. to come out and slaughter it and butcher it. Uh, they don't, technically speaking, take physical ownership of the pig. I, as the farmer, you know, maintain that on site, um, but that's overlooked for the purposes of this. Mm -hmm. uh, the butcher still has to be certified. Um, they have to have a, you know, inspected clean facility, but they're inspected by the WSDA, uh, the State Department of Agriculture, as opposed to the USDA, the Federal Department mm -hmm. of Agriculture. Um, the inspection process is a little less rigorous. You know, the inspector comes out and um, observes, you know, once or twice a year, the butcher doing slaughter, cutting up and says, yep, you're using, you know, stainless steel equipment. Everything's done in a food safe fashion. Animal is in a cooler um, mm -hmm. soon enough to prevent the growth of foodborne illness, so on and so forth. Um, and your limitation as a grower there is that you can only sell animals by the whole or the half. Yep. Uh, if you're doing beef, you can sell it by the quarter, but not with okay. pigs. Um, and you have to sell it to the end consumer. Um, and, and, so, and you do pre-sell it in a way. You so have they to pre-sell it. it but you, yeah. you're in possession of it as the farmer. But Yeah, but I couldn't get it processed uh, custom exempt by a WSDA certified butcher, put it in my freezer and then sell it later on. Yeah, that would be it. not within the uh, okay. limits of the rules yeah. there. Okay. Um, so I basically go and drum up customers early in the season, kind of similar to a CSA model with mm -hmm. veggies like Viva does, yeah. uh, as well as many other farmers. And that has the added benefit of, at least the way I do it, uh, I charge a deposit ahead of time sure, just yeah. as a placeholder to make sure people are going to be there in the fall to purchase the rest of the animal. Mm -hmm. So I'll charge for a whole pig 
250 bucks or 125 bucks for a side of pork in the spring and that gives me enough money to uh, pay my breeder for the piglets that I get in the springtime and also for a little bit of the feed to raise them part of the way so I'm not financing the entire operation out of my own pocket. Mm -hmm. um, it's basically kind of like a loan from the consumer sure. to myself early yeah. in the season, which is nice, but you have a very limited market when you sell that way. Not everyone is gonna have the desire to buy that much pork. Yeah. Not everyone is gonna have the cash to pay for everything um, up front like that. And not everyone is gonna have the freezer space to you know, stick an entire side of pork yeah. uh, in there for the winter. So. Mm -hmm. You know, I got to a point where I realized that like selling more than 15 or 20 hogs this way was going to require a much higher level of effort on my part in terms of marketing, Just which farther yeah. geographic area. Yeah, you have to go down to Seattle in this case, take out advertisements, beat the bushes, talk to people, which that might be for some people. Yeah. That's not what I enjoy most yeah. about farming and Honestly, it takes a lot of time and energy, which I don't have necessarily <laughs> yeah. to put towards that sure. and still yeah. do the actual farming myself. And yeah. so I opted to cut that off at a certain point and pursue U uh, USDA slaughter. Yep. Um, so with USDA slaughter, you are getting your animals processed by a butcher that is inspected by the United States Department of Agriculture. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, there are very, very few USDA certified butchers left in the United States compared to what there were a decade ago, two decades ago, three decades ago. Mm -hmm. You know, there used to be a lot of smaller, regionally specific um, butchers, you know, because there used to be a lot more smaller regionally specific farmers. Um, with the consolidation of agriculture in this country, which has gotten more and more, you know, we are at a point now where 97% of the hogs in this country are raised in factory farming operations, mm -hmm. um, primarily in four states, Iowa, North Carolina, um, which if you read the news now after Hurricane Florence yeah. has become uh, an environmental hazard. Um, uh, so, sure. and then Minneapolis and, or excuse me, Minnesota, um, and the fourth, Dakotas it, or something? Ohio. I want to okay. say, yeah. I'm not positive. I have to look yeah. that up. But the majority of the pigs are raised in factory farms. You know, where there might be two thousand, five thousand, ten thousand pigs in one giant warehouse and they are usually raised by um, contract farmers who raise them for bigger corporations who operate their own USDA certified butcher facility where they're drawing from all these big factory farms that they contract with to process hundreds if not thousands yeah, of pigs a, a day. centralized location. Exactly, yeah. And if I come in as a small farmer and say, hey, I got 60 pigs this year, I'd like to get butchered. They don't do that, that it's yeah. not, not really an option. So if you're lucky enough to live in a region where there are still you know, a small USDA butcher or two, that might be an option. However, they're gonna have limited capacity. And so you may have to spend some time waiting for other farmers who are utilizing their services to get out of the game so you can get into the game. Mm -hmm. um, I get the majority of my USDA processing done by a cooperative that was against a lot of odds able to start up in the Skagit Valley. Wow. Um, I want to say about 15 years ago, maybe a little bit more, maybe a little bit less. Okay. Um, and they were started by a group of farmers like myself, some smaller, some bigger, mm -hmm. uh, but none, you know, doing more than a couple hundred animals per year who were frustrated by the lack of services. And so they all tossed in money and expertise and were lucky enough to have access to a location that had previously been a butcher shop wow. and found the right people to wade through all the paperwork, um, wait, acquire the equipment and get a business model going. And uh, yeah, there's a little nice USDA slaughter cooperative, which is extra nice in the fact that they have a mobile unit. They have wow. a slaughter truck that they can bring out on site, which is another level of difficulty. Um, yeah. But that being said, I had to be, you know, spend about five years on their waiting list before they were able, yeah, to be willing to fit me in. Someone yeah. else um, that they provided services to had to stop raising pigs so wow. that they could, you know, 
fit me in there. Mm -hmm. um, and that's not going to be an option for everybody. To give you an idea of what you might have to do if that wasn't an option, I have a few more pigs that I want to get slaughtered through USDA butcher than they're able to accommodate. And so every fall now, I basically will, you know, load up eight or 10 hogs in a stock trailer, which I bought, borrow a pickup truck that's big enough to pull it. Uh -huh. And I haul them down to Portland, you know, which wow. is about, what is it to Portland? Like a six hour drive? Yeah. 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 yeah one fun. way, one way to, to unload them there. Last uh, year I did it um, on the evening of Thanksgiving. I had an early <laughs> dinner with my family and then drove down there <laughs> and uh, yeah, I dropped them off. But you know, that's, that's what you do because yeah. that's what your options are. And so that's, mm -hmm. that's sort of the closest that is where there's room exactly and in western washington there are to my knowledge only two usda certified butchers one is that co-op which yeah. has limitations the other one is another mobile unit which was built by the pierce county conservation district oh. and then is contracted out to um someone who operates it and it's been uh operating on and off because the people who purchased it you know they are trying to figure out how to, to run it effectively. Yeah. And, you know, they've got shut down a couple of times sure. uh, for honestly, for humane handling violations, they weren't able to um, process the animals quickly and humanely enough for the USDA's liking or for my liking as a farmer. Yeah. And so they got their permit pulled until they could say how they're going to address it. And, you know, that's not yeah. reliable, nor is it desirable. So yeah, yeah that's been a problem. Wow. Yeah. So definitely challenges. Mm -hmm for like s s scale, size, mm -hmm. challenges, consolidation mm -hmm. in the industry. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, and we're lucky to have some of those services mm -hmm. here in the valley, though, as you say, yeah, it's not, you don't just call them up out of the blue. It's no, a, no, a and if other people wanted to get into this and start from scratch, they wouldn't really honestly be able to take advantage of those services yeah. until someone else got out, so it's a limiting factor. Yeah. Um, so, you know, someone could come in and start uh, raising hogs um, and then contract with the WSDA certified butcher to do custom exempt slaughter, but they would probably max out at being able to sell, you know, 15, 20, maybe Whatever 30 animals per yeah. year. Yeah. Yep. And that's not enough to make a living off of. Yeah. It's not even enough to make a portion of a living off of, yeah. um, depending on how you look at it. Mm -hmm. um, so you definitely have to do something else, which is not prohibitive, but it's not necessarily easy yeah. either. So I want to ask about um, sort of, you know, the resources that you need to have in place if you're preparing for the season or preparing mm -hmm. to start, a, you know, a pig enterprise. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I guess what are the resources you need to have in place and, and sort of what are some of the things you need to be planning for? Okay. Um, well, as I had mentioned earlier, like your biggest needs in raising pigs are going to be your services first of all butcher services um, your access to feed whether you're growing it yourself or buying it you know having a nice workable relationship with a local mill has mm -hmm. been super helpful for me um, you also need access to land that's a huge one yeah um, which you know for doing pigs specifically can be kind of hard to come by mm -hmm. and not everyone who has land that they're willing yeah. to rent out to people who want to start farming, want pigs on it. You know, sense. they want something that's a little bit more bucolic looking and people have kind of got out of the habit of seeing pigs as part of the landscape since they've been effectively removed from it as a agricultural business, you know, mm -hmm. all that's done inside warehouses now where people can't see it. And so when they do see it, um, it is usually a little different than they expect. Mm -hmm. um, but anyhow, once you get those things covered, you have the more practical needs, which um, are some sort of pen to keep the animals in. Uh, in some cases, you might have a physical barrier um, that would keep them contained, but for the most part, you need some sort of fencing. Hmm. Um, I use portable electric fencing. Uh, Premier One is the company that makes that. There are maybe one or two other options, but they're, they're the main one. They make a nice product and they make a pig-specific product, hmm. which I've found really versatile, uh, durable, um, and easy to use. Cool. Uh, you're just hooking up car batteries. Yeah, you it. can you can plug it into um, a alternating current source, basically a plug-in uh, energizer if you need to. Since I'm doing my animals out on pasture and moving them around, and don't really have great access to um, 
electricity as utility. I use portable deep cycle marine RV batteries um, and an energizer that's designed to uh, be a, serve as a go-between between, between ah. the fencing and that particular type of energy source. Um, there are solar energizers as well. Um, I've been meaning to experiment with those, but didn't get to it this year. Mm -hmm. Just another layer of cost and something I didn't have in the budget. Um, so fencing, energizer, power source, you also need uh, some sort of shelter. Pigs are pretty tough animals, but there are situations when it's like super sunny out, they can be prone to sunburn. Um, when it's super cold and rainy out, you know, they'll survive and they'll do okay, but they're more comfortable if they have some sort of shelter. I've opted to use calf domes or calf hutches, which are used in dairy operations. Um, to uh, wean animals off of their mother so they can continue taking the milk. Um, that's another thing, but they, they serve the purpose really well. Um, you can probably fit, you know, seven or eight full grown pigs in one of those things yeah. comfortably. Sure. Um, they're light enough that one person can move them on their own. You don't need a truck or a tractor mm. to drag some really heavy solid structure. And they're solid enough that uh, it will take the pigs probably a couple of years to destroy one. They will destroy it eventually. Yeah, They'll sure. destroy anything eventually. They're yeah. they're well, we tip that one up, but yeah. you can start to see it's it's wearing a little bit. Yeah. Um, yeah. So on the continued subject of infrastructure, you need some sort of uh, way to create a pen to keep the pigs where you want them. You need some sort of shelter for them, and then you need to be able to provide them with access to feed and water. I have chosen to opt for large feeders that can hold a large quantity of feed, uh, and that is dependent on having a uh, feed provider, a mill in this case that has a truck that can come and empty feed straight into the feeders. Mm -hmm. um, some farmers opt to use smaller feeders, trough style feeders, which they put feed into every day. That is a lot of work to do it every day. Um, you know, these guys at this age, um, which is pretty close to slaughter, are going through 60 pigs worth, I would say several hundred pounds of feed a day. You wow. know, that's a lot to move by hand. Um, and if you get to a point where you're busy and you don't have it out there in time, you end up with a lot of unhappy, stressed out pigs. Yeah, so yeah. that wasn't a great option when I was thinking about it. So you need some sort of feeders. These are, um, I don't know if you can see them in the background there, large metal feeders. One holds about 2,000 pounds, the other one holds about 1,000 pounds. I was able to pick them up used. There's not a ton of used ones around. I had to drive to Idaho for those, which wow. is, you know, a full day's driving back. Um, you can buy them new. They're not inconsequential in price. You yeah. know, something like that would probably cost a couple grand. Um, but if you take care of it, it'll last for a while and will more than pay for itself in terms mm -hmm. of the labor it saves. Sure. Um, they also keep the feed dry when it's wet out. Um, they're designed for hogs specifically. They have a little flap um, that the pig will lift up with its nose, which kind of mimics the natural rooting action they oh, have. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that has the added benefit of keeping feed dry in wet weather and also keeping rodents out of it. Mm -hmm. um, so they work out pretty well. And then you need some sort of water source. Um, I use stock tanks with uh, nipple waters screwed into them. They're kind of a giant version of what you might have for your little pet gerbil, you know, <laughs> they just kind of yeah. push it with their, their tongue and water drips out. Um, that has enough water in it, the ones I have set up to keep the pigs happy for about a day. So I have to come out and add water every day. I have in the past set up um, auto waters, but where the animals are out now and the water source that I have available to me, that hasn't been um, a feasible option yet. With a little bit more brainstorming and some work, I could probably make it uh, happen, but it hasn't been a priority this year. So we're just kind of running for what we have. Uh, expecting to see a pig in one of those giant balls that hamsters also wear. <laughs> <laughs> I want that, yeah. I want that too. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but that's that's more or less all you need. There are some other incidentals which are helpful. Um, you know, you can see these blue barrels here. I use those to put extra feed in if they're making a delivery and they have a bit more feed than will fit mm. into the feeders, those overflow. Um, I have, you know, T-post and uh, welded wire uh, livestock panels, which I can use to set up temporary pens, or I usually leave one of those, they're, they're a bit more solid of a pen, they're much smaller, so they're not feasible 
to use exclusively for your pen, but if for some reason the electric fence fails and the pigs destroy a section of it, having the welded wire panel set up and ready to go is someplace that I can chase the pigs into, mm -hmm. get them penned off while I figure out the, the bigger pen. Yeah. Um, so stuff like that, five gallon buckets, uh, T-post pounders, hammers. Uh, I've invested in a really nice weed whacker so I can go and create a area in the pasture where the grass and other vegetation is not going to contact the fence and ground it out mm -hmm. um, when I set it up. Um, if the fence is getting touched mm -hmm. by too much vegetation, it lowers. Yep, it basically. The power through it. Yeah, it sucks electricity out of the system, and the fence all of a sudden is not as hot anymore, and so it won't serve as a, an effective deterrent for the mm -hmm. pigs. And if they realize that it's not hot anymore, then they don't respect it, and they will continually break out of it. You know, a lot of electric fencing works as like a psychological barrier. They think it's more of a barrier than it actually is. Yeah. And as long as you can keep them convinced of that, yeah, you're sure, in good shape. Sure. Once they figure out otherwise, they're they're very smart. And so it will take a lot of effort to talk them back into respecting it. So you don't want that to happen. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's, it's not much, but at the same time, it is a lot of infrastructure. I would say what we have out here right now, if you purchased all of it new, would probably be in excess of $10,000. Mm -hmm. um, so you have to have cash. That's the yeah. other thing, you know to get started you have to have cash and if you start small you need less cash because you only need you know you know four rolls of fencing instead of 20 you yeah. know you only need one small feeder as opposed to two really big ones yeah. um, but you do need money um, mm -hmm. and you also need money to keep the operation going throughout the year yeah. with what we're doing we're effectively an all-in all-out sort of operation so the animals themselves are like a giant bank throughout the course of the year sure. we just keep putting money in in the spring for the the piglets and then you know feed 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 kind of um, goes up you know like this mm -hmm. over the course of the year and you know by the time we're at slaughter in the fall like there is a really significant amount of money in there. And you can offset yeah. that a little bit by, if you have people pre-ordering pigs in the spring, charging a deposit. Um, but otherwise you have to be prepared to front that out of your own pocket, or you have to have some sort of collateral that you can use to get a loan. Um, I've not looked into it, but I have a hard time imagining most lending institutions seeing the pigs themselves as collateral you would have to have a really good business plan and probably a history of having done it year after year for them to look at that and sure. say like yeah we'll lend you money on that so yeah. you, but there could be potentially like mm -hmm. fsa loans or like as a operating loans but could be potentially an instrument to potentially but i have not looked into yeah. that so i really yeah. couldn't couldn't speak to it yeah. um generally my understanding of financing on that level is that financing institutions will finance things that are familiar to them. Yeah. And what we're doing here is unfortunately not that common. I was also wondering about, um, you know, kind of pig's role in a more, you know, holistic farming operation in terms of, you know, their effects on soil, nutrient management, rotation, mm -hmm. that sort of thing. If you could talk to that a little bit. Yeah, I can speak to my experience with that. I'm, I'm due disclosure, not the expert here. Mm -hmm. What I am doing in terms of my enterprise is it, itself an experiment. Like mm -hmm. I am basically starting with a premise, which I think is sound in that if you integrate animals into an agricultural model um, and rotate you know crops through that afterwards it is a more healthy system you're basically creating a sort of closed loop where you are providing some of the fertility necessary to grow crops in subsequent years mm -hmm. through the application of manure by the animals in previous years. Um, depending on who you ask, pigs also have the added benefit of working ground up prior to um, planting in it. Um, they are effectively little tractors. You know, mm -hmm. they can turn the ground up um, and, you know, 
leave you with something that you can see here mm -hmm. is already reminiscent of something that's been tilled a little bit. Yep. That being said, you still have to come in afterwards with the tractor to level it out, work manure into it, um, you know, create tilth in the soil. They mm -hmm. create compaction, yeah, compaction for sure. Well. Yeah, in certain places. And they definitely leave a sort of moonscape, you know, they'll have spots where they've created wallows and, you know, left it uneven. Um, and there are some people who don't think that is a, a viable way of farming. You know, they, you know, want their ground to be always constantly well managed and nice and even, you know, difference of opinion mm -hmm. there, but you know, time will tell hopefully. Yeah. Um, where I raised my pigs last year, um, which is over uh, that way, uh, I'm gonna be planting wheat this fall. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm kind of curious to see how that wheat responds to, you know, where the pigs have been before. We've got some data from uh, wheat that Viva grew on the ground where the pigs are now, where animals had not been. So we might be able to compare yields there and sure. say like, hey, is there higher yields where pig manure has been put down? Yeah. But we're learning as we go. Um, yeah, like, I, like I said, the theory is sound, I think. Yeah. But, mm -hmm. you know, there's not a whole lot of practical data out there for the way that farming is done now in a very compartmentalized fashion where animals are raised, you know, separate indoors. Um, and oftentimes that manure is connected, collected, excuse me, mm -hmm. and reapplied to fields, but it's not done in a direct fashion anymore. So that's kind of a, a question mark. Yeah. 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 I think that'll be interesting to compare, mm -hmm. like you were saying, like even protein levels and those sorts of things yeah. like in the, yeah. you know, the specs of the wheat to uh -huh. see is there a difference? And obviously yeah. there's lots of variables, but, yeah. but I think, yeah, that's great. Yeah. So another question is, um, you know, how does the pig operation fit into your business? Sort of what are, what are the limitations around it as far as its role it plays in the business and, and how do you manage some of the risks associated with pig farming specifically? Well, I suppose I would answer that by saying that ever since I started my farming business, I have pretty religiously adhered to this policy of not putting all of my eggs in one basket. Mm -hmm. I don't just raise pigs. I raise pigs. I raise chickens for meat, chickens for eggs. Mm -hmm. I grow vegetables. And on a separate level, I don't market everything that I grow in one place. Some of what I do, I direct market. Some of what I do, I uh, sell at farmer's markets, some directly to consumers mm -hmm. who come to the farm and pick it up. Uh, some of what I do, I wholesale to restaurants, some to grocery stores. I basically try and spread myself out so that if one thing doesn't go quite as well as I expect um, or, you know, on some level fails, mm -hmm. I still have other sources of income other places to sell my product that can sustain me through those those low periods mm -hmm. um, and as you know I progress along with a certain venture pigs in this case if I see that it has more potential you know which it it has for me mm -hmm. personally over the past couple of years like pork is more and more becoming a popular meat um, mm -hmm. there was a time and a place where it was kind of considered a more lowlier source of protein. You know, people were really interested in beef if they could afford it and pork was something um, that you ate if you had less money. And there were certain parts of the pig too, uh, ironically enough, bacon, which is like the most popular yeah. cut right now that we're seen as eating low on the hog. You know, uh -huh. that was only something you, you bought if you didn't have enough money to get pork chops or something nicer. Um, but, you know, the market response uh, has been great. You know, I feel like I could potentially, if I had access to more slaughter services, more storage, uh, enough money to finance a larger operation and land mm -hmm. to do it on, that I could continue to scale the business mm -hmm. up and grow it. Um, that being said, it would get to a point where I would have to do more of that as wholesaling, which comes with its own set of challenges because once you start wholesaling, you go from getting this much for what you grow to getting this much. You know, if people are buying your product and reselling it themselves, they want to cut. So you can't charge as much. So you got to raise more and take less for it. So there's 
a little bit of a wash there, but uh, you know, it, it's a growth part of my business right now. That being said, I'm not gonna stop doing all the other things that I do and focus strictly on pigs because something might change. You know, my land access might change. I might not be able to raise what I think that I need in order to make a living. So I'm gonna keep doing veggies. Uh, I'm gonna keep doing chickens to some extent and you know, juggle these various things around based on all of the criteria, you know, that I have for what I want my operation to be and what seems like it's going to make me a well-rounded, stable income. Mm -hmm. um, does that yeah. answer your question? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah, thanks again, uh, Eric Olson from Wellfed Farms. Uh, this has been a Viva Farms video production. And uh, thanks again, Eric. Yeah, thank you for your interest and for giving me time and a platform to speak about what I've learned. Um, you know, what I'm doing is working for me pretty well. Um, I think there's opportunity for other beginning farmers to get into livestock and integrate it into their own operations. You know, just to disclaim once again, what I'm doing may not be, you know, for everybody, both in terms of their inclinations and what might work in a specific um, agricultural area or market scenario, but you know, there are a lot of opportunities to be had there and um, a lot of opportunities for people to help develop the business model further. You know, I feel like I'm kind of starting out in new territory and trying to build something that works, but the more people that are doing it, the more you know, collective brain power mm -hmm. and uh, wisdom that's going to be brought into it and the better things are going to get. Yeah. So appreciate Viva's role in making that happen as well. Yeah. Thanks so much. Yeah. Thank you.